also Melinda asked me if I would talk about um, potential vorticity and and very much concentrating on where the ideas came from and and my sort of role in that and perhaps where it might go. But uh, so I'm very happy to do that. It's a it's a very different talk from the one I've ever given before. So uh, I certainly uh, had to think what to put into this one, and I hope it's of interest to you all. So my topic then is potential vorticity, and I'm going to go uh, back to, uh, if I can go on, right, okay. So going to go very much go back to um, where the potential vorticity theory started and the uses of that. And um, this goes back really to Rossby in, in two amazing papers back in 1939 and 1940. And the first one of those, he pointed out that it was the vertical component of vorticity. Um, so the absolute vorticity with, in my notation and the Coriolis parameter plus the relative vorticity. And it's that one that's most important. And he talked about the conservation of absolute vorticity in 2D non-divergent horizontal motion. And this then has the ideas which follow on very much through what I'm going to be talking about. That first, the absolute vorticity is conserved. And then if you know the absolute vorticity, you can actually invert it to get the stream function and then the flow. And so you then have the advecting velocity and you have the basis of a complete model there, provided you have boundary conditions for the stream function and then you can actually integrate such a model. And that's what Charney did in the first place uh, in um, Princeton. And then he moved on to say, well, if, the, if there is a height to your fluid, probably from bottom topography, then the conservation would not be just zeta, it'd be zeta divided by the height of the fluid. So that, that's then conserved in this 2D motion. Um, H being the height of the cylinder. And you get then already the idea on the picture on the right hand side, I don't know if you can see my cursor, that then you, if we think of a cylinder between the top and bottom surfaces, if that cylinder is stretched, then it will spin up. And if it's shrunk, then it will spin down. So we have those ideas coming in. And Rossby moved sort of seamlessly from that to saying then, well, the end of the cylinder could be on isentropic surfaces. And then we have a more general conservation, no longer simply 2D motion. Um, and um, the vorticity then should be calculated from taking derivatives of the velocity on these surfaces. So we get the idea not only of stretching of this vortex tube, but it could actually be tilting, the tilting of vorticity as well. And um, so this is on an isentropic surface. And that, that really is an amazing result he came up with there. And um, totally separately from that, Ertl, very much from the mathematical point of view, Rossby was able to do maths, but he came from very much physical arguments. And Ertl then in the paper in 1942, came up with this result that um, if zeta is the absolute vorticity, the vector absolute vorticity, then one over rho zeta dot grad s, where s is any function of pressure and density, then you can move the d by dt through to only operate on the s. So that's an amazing sort of mathematical result, but uh, it certainly works out. Um, you can perform that. And in particular, if you take s to be potential temperature, then it is a function of p and rho or the entropy. And then you have one over rho zeta dot grad theta is, um, and that's the rate of change moving with the fluid then of what we'll call the potential vorticity. And it's only, it would be conserved, but for then a frictional, a curl of a frictional force or a, a change in potential temperature, a heat source or sink. So that's the coming from two very different directions. And I think Rossby and Ertl did meet, but, and, um, I'm not sure there was much that value came from it because I think their, their perspectives were so different, but it's quite useful to go through um, what, uh, what this means then, just taking the relationship there. So if we look 
at a, a cylinder between two isentropic surfaces. There's the, the old result then about the circulation around the, a circuit like this, that the circulation is conserved. Conserving a circulation around a circuit is a nice result, but it's, it's really rather, rather difficult to apply to understand and predict any motion. But if you turn that into the vorticity uh, times the area, then that would be conserved. And if you take a cylinder like this, the mass being conserved, so that's rho delta s delta h. And if you divide one by the other, you get something very much like the Rossby result that zeta over zeta n over rho delta h is conserved. But if you also then multiply by, um, by delta theta, then you get the result there. And that relates directly to, to then what I would very much refer to as Rossby earth or potential vorticity, because if we go to the limit, that's exactly what we had here. So this is what Rossby was dealing with. And this is what we call potential vorticity these days. Um, when I first gave a lecture on, in France when I was at NCAR back in 1970, I think. Um, Jules Charney was in the audience. I didn't know he was there because if I, if I had known, I'd have been rather scared of giving the talk. But anyway, after the talk, I'd called it Ertl Potential Vorticity. And he grabbed me afterwards and took me to the library and said, you should be calling it Rossby Potential Vorticity because look, Rossby did this. And so perhaps we should have both names associated with that coming from very different directions. So the subsequent use of this potential vorticity really all followed from Rossby's work. And it was in Chicago and wider then that the potential vorticity was used. And it was the tracer aspect that was very much used in observational case studies. And in particular, it was giving the, the likely origin of the air. So if you saw a large potential vorticity, you could think that had come from a reservoir of larger potential vorticity. And the, the biggest reservoir of large potential vorticity is a stratosphere. And this is where this was particularly used in studies of upper tropospheric fronts. And they were used to, if you saw a large potential vorticity, you said that air has probably come directly from the stratosphere. And, and the idea of tropospause folds. I'll show you one picture of work I did uh, modeling those, but the names Reed Danielson very much involved in that. And this was of particular interest at this time because there'd been all the nuclear weapons testing and all the uh, radioactive materials were put into the high atmosphere, the stratosphere, and everyone hoped that was the last they saw of them. But then suddenly in certain regions, there was right down low in the troposphere, some of this material, this radioactive material appeared. Uh, in particular, there was one in California. And so there's a lot of concern, how was this happening? And so that's where the study of these upper air fronts really got a lot of support and where this work came in. Now in a, a rather different direction, Kleinschmidt um, was working in Germany and he was using potential vorticity ideas to look at the development of cyclonic systems. And he um, didn't have any real idea of invertibility to help him, but he very much stressed the importance of the stratosphere in these developing these cyclonic systems. He talked about producing masses, et cetera. And he was so much out on a limb that um, no one else seemed to really understand what he was talking about. And it certainly didn't fit in with the theories around. In fact, the, the people organizing the Hambuch der Physik got Eliasson and Klein Schmidt to write an article for the Hambuch der Physik, but they, they couldn't actually write together. So Eliasson wrote, wrote one part and Klein Schmidt wrote the other part. And those two, there is almost no link between them. So that was the use of PV. It was very much really as a tracer and Kleinschmidt trying to use it with some ideas that it gave the flow, but there wasn't really the theory there. So we then come to quasi-geostrophic theory, which was occurring at the same time, developed by Charney, Edie Eliasson and others. Um, and 
Charney and Stern wrote this great paper in 1962, drawing it all together, really, and talking about quasi-geostrophic pseudo potential vorticity, they called it, because they knew it wasn't it, the same as the Rossby Ertl potential vorticity. So the conservation of little q. Um, and they did talk about the relationship with the um, full potential vorticity. They, they showed that it's um, the quasi-geostrophic pseudo or just potential vorticity, as we call it. Its behavior on quasi-horizontal surfaces mimics that of the full Ertl potential vorticity on the theta surface. And they gave the sort of link between the two. But um, quasi-geostrophic theory is based on this small Rossby number and a small departure from a reference stratus stratification. And that very much limits its sort of practical use. And it was used in some weather forecast models for a period and also by Norman Phillips in his, uh, his excellent climate simulation that he did. But in general, um, quasi-geostrophic theory was the domain of the theoreticians. Um, and really the, um, the more observational practical meteorologists didn't really go near it, it with one uh, exception. And that was the omega equation, which is part of quasi-geostrophic theory. And that was very much part of um, the synoptic armory as well, thinking about the forcing, the, the forcing of vertical velocity consistent with quasi-geostrophic theory. In fact, they, they were so separate that most synopticians would not be aware that the omega equation was part of quasi-geostrophic theory. And I think even most theoreticians didn't really recognize the omega equation either. So um, they were really rather separate. So we have potential vorticity, which went off into its observational thing, and quasi-geostrophic theory very much in the domain, I think I'm right to say, of the theoreticians. So that was the sort of background, really, when I came into the subject. And um, my background is, uh, as Melinda said, a mathematician. Uh, I did maths in Cambridge as an undergraduate. And then, then the fourth year, very, very much in applied ma mathematics, in fact, in continuum mechanics, really. Um, and one of the courses there was on geophysical fluid dynamics given by Francis Bretherton. And that seemed really interesting application of mathematics. And that's the PhD that I moved on to a PhD with Francis Bretherton on frontogenesis, so the formation of fronts in the atmosphere. Now, I think it was valuable being at the Department of Applied Mass and Theoretical Physics in, in Cambridge. There's very much good, uh, good applied mathematicians there, but very interested in applying their mathematics to real fluid situations. And that was the sort of background and, and getting simple arguments which linked the theory and what one actually saw. So the, um, the papers I certainly had behind me at the time were those on frontal circulation equation um, by Sawyer and Eliasson. Um, and there was an approximation there that the motion along the front was geostrophic, but not the motion across the front. So this sort of uh, asymmetric, um, so it's not full quasi-geostrophic. And there, Eliasson showed a coordinate transformation was very useful in that. And in terms of frontal models, um, then there were models based on quasi-geostrophic theory, Stone, and he showed what was called frontogenesis, but it didn't form anything like a discontinuity. It was just got a gradually stronger temperature gradient uh, in a deformation, a temperature contrast in a deformation field. And then Terry Williams, at the start of my PhD, he integrated a primitive equation model with an ED wave and took it out of the linear regime into a nonlinear regime. But again, this is uniform potential vorticity. And that exhibited very strong frontogenesis at the surface and the lid. So it was in trying to understand that, that I, uh, using the techniques of Eliasson, that I actually got somewhere. I used this coordinate transformation in the model equations and found that both these problems, the one by Stone and Williams, the ED model, both of them reduced to the, the same form as quasi-geostrophic theory in the transformed coordinate. And this, so um, 
I put in a couple of equations here. This wasn't necessarily the, my approach, but if you use the geopotential, this is F plus the, the vorticity, just dv dx, and that's um, d theta dz and minus dv dz d theta dx. So that's equal to the potential vorticity in these quasi two dimensional situations. And so we have a nonlinear elliptic equation there, which is actually a mon jamper equation. And I didn't know it at the time, but a, a standard way to reduce, reduce that to, to normal form is, is, um, is to use this coordinate transformation, which was the one that Eliasson introduced. So if you introduce that coordinate transformation, then you actually introduce the, reduce this to a standard elliptic form. So that was in, in my uh, work there, P was actually constant. So I was dealing with these just phi x x plus phi z z equals one. So you could use all the armory of, of uh, dealing with that. So a couple of solutions. Um, this was when we I just had a uniform. Um, so this is Stone's model, but doing it using this so-called semi-geostrophic theory. And these show um, isentropes in the cross frontal direction. So this is horizontal vertical isentropes uh, and the motion along those in the cross front direction. And these show uh, contours of the wind into the section. You know, I won't go into this, but you, it's forming in a finite time uh, and almost discontinuity here. And you see these surfaces tend to become parallel. And that's what happens with potential vorticity actually. Potential vorticity conservation means the only way this can happen is, is actually by these surfaces becoming parallel. I'll say a little bit more in a moment about that, but this is my attempt to model an upper air front where I took a stratosphere with a large potential vorticity and a troposphere with lower potential vorticity, and again, a deformation. And instead of being this shape, when you've deformed it, then you get this upper air front forming with the isentrope, with the uh, stratosphere tending to come down the isentropes in something looking um, very pleasingly like the upper air fronts that uh, Reed and Danielson and others observed. And you have here then this region of large potential vorticity here, and this region of low potential vorticity here, and the isentropes can't cross this boundary here. So somehow you've got to get a match here. So these isentropes here are pushed apart. The stratification is less, but the vorticity is very large. And in this side, in the troposphere, the stratification is much larger than the troposphere elsewhere, but then the anti you have strong anticyclonic vorticity. So there's a matching across this surface here. And there's the germ of what uh, later I wrote this paper on 3D semi-geostrophic equations. And they are basically like the quasi-geostrophic, but in these transformed coordinates in two directions. And it's potential vorticity that is vectored in three dimensions. And it's uh, very much part of that theory is potential vorticity gives the st stability of the atmosphere to uh, in the uh, cross direction and the vertical direction. So it's always providing the stiffness of the atmosphere in those two directions. So I don't want to spend too long on, on that area here, but I did then want to move on to the paper, which is, is by a far the longest one I've ever written. Um, and what was it? I can't remember now, 70 or 80 pages. I always recommend it to people if they're, if they're suffering from um, having difficulty going to sleep. I mean, it's long enough that you're bound to be asleep by the end of it. So um, anyway, our paper in 1985 in the Quarterly Journal. And the background to that paper then is that we, um, from 1979 onwards, we were making use of the global analyses from ECMWF. Um, it was Mike Wallace and Maurice Blackman and others are starting using NMC data in the 70s. And when I came back from the States, I wanted to do the same with this new ECMWF data and got permission to do so. And we used those and amazing riches that was to, to actually have at your desk a global analysis that you could then look at the atmosphere in any region you wanted and perform any diagnostic you wanted. So that was a major background to have that data. And people were starting to use, um, I think Clough came before this actually, Sid Clough, 
starting to use these analyses to look at various aspects. So McIntyre and Palmer in 1983 and 84 looked at, at um, isentropic surfaces in the stratosphere uh, to look at the behavior there. And that was a rather realistic depiction in ECMWF data. At least it looked realistic. It looked like fluid mechanics. At last, you could see the atmosphere as a real fluid. So, um, uh, so I, at Reading, we've been looking at this ECMWF data. And a student of mine, Andy Robertson, um, the, the, the study he'd started with, um, I'd suggested was he, he tried to use our Reading spectral model and look at the simulations of baroclinic wave life cycles. But instead of using the sigma coordinate that we had, he tried to turn it into a theta coordinate model. And it's not easy because of the boundary conditions always. Theta coordinates are wonderful if you didn't have a lower boundary. And well, the results were okay, but they weren't dramatic. And he definitely needed more for his PhD. So I said, well, why don't you get some PV pictures from ECMWF analyses for a range of lower tropospheric isentropes? And let's see what we can see. And wow, what he produced them. Um, they were just brilliant. Absolutely. So here was the troposphere um, immediately looking like a fluid, challenging you to understand how these um, structures were developing and changing. And um, so that was the background for our paper. Um, I showed Michael McIntyre the pictures we got and, and we agreed we, sh we should all write these up. And as we wrote it up, we thought, well, we ought to put this in. Well, we really ought to put this in. Well, we really ought to put this in. And so it grew and grew. And um, I don't know whether we had the right title for the paper. My, Michael hated it later because it was as if isentropic potential vorticity was a quantity itself. And what it should have said is potential vorticity on isentropic surfaces. Anyway, so that was the paper. And crucial to all this is the two aspects that Rossby had right from the beginning, that here we have Lagrangian conservation of this potential vorticity, so it acts as a tracer of the fluid, but then crucially for the full potential vorticity, we need invertibility as well. So that's the idea that given the potential vorticity at any time, you can invert it to give any aspect of the flow that you want the horizontal wind, the vertical wind, the potential temperature, you name it. And the only conditions you need for this basically are you need the mass distribution between isentropic surfaces and you need some sort of balance condition. And so those are the two major aspects, the tracer aspect and invertibility. And um, I'm just going to show you one picture here, this just to make sure you're familiar with what the atmosphere might look like if we're using isentropes and potential vorticity. So this is a sort of zonally averaged and time average cross section actually for the northern hemisphere winter. And I've in green here you see a few isentropes. That's the three, uh, 390, this is 360, 330 and 300. 300 slopes up from the surface in the equatorial region up to the tropopause in the polar region, which is rather nice sort of symmetry, and 330 uh, there. And um, just building on ideas which were back there from Sir Napier Shaw back in, in the 1920s, um, he talked about the overworld and the underworld. Well, I put an extra middle world on this because it's a, you can see from the frontal world work and from many other things that isentropes crossing the tropopause are particularly important. Um, and the middle world is where the isentropes cross the tropopause and the underworld is where underneath that. I won't go into that in any more detail here, otherwise I'll never get through it all. But, um, and the circles here show you the tropopause roughly. And then these contours here show you potential vorticity in what we took as the potential vorticity units. And so there's a half here, it's low in the equatorial region, it's higher in the polar region, that's one. It gets higher as you go up. And then in the stratosphere, it's a lot higher. You go, this is one and this is four. In fact, in any, on any individual day at any place, 
there's a sharp transition from a number one and a half or less up to probably four or more in the stratosphere. And it's only the smoothing gone on here that means you don't see that. So if we look on an isentropic surface, say 330, we're going to see the um, troposphere down here and the stratosphere up here with its large potential vorticity. On something like 315, we're going to see a little bit of the polar stratosphere here. If we go up to 360 or th somewhere up there, we're seeing a lot of stratosphere with a bit of the upper troposphere in the tropics. So um, one of the things we can do then is look at potential vorticity as it moves along as on an isentropic surface. The isentropic surface will move with the potential vorticity apart from sources and sinks and will move on that. And um, so we can look at maps like that. Alternatively, we can look at a potential vorticity surface and look at the um, isentropes moving along that. So a particularly valuable one actually is taking potential vorticity two as roughly a tropopause, and I call it the dynamical tropopause. So on the dynamical tropopause, PV2, we can look at the isentropes moving. And again, there'll be a tracer of the air. And I should say all this works in the free troposphere pretty well, except for the sources and sinks, which if they're on a radiative time scale, that's about a week or so. So it's pretty well conserved. But of course, if you get a lot of latent heat release, then, then the conservation properties will be blown out of the water. So it can change. So in fact, these are today some potential vorticity maps for today. This is on a 315 surface. And that shows the, the stratospheric values here and the tropospheric values here. And um, if we look at this region here, this air has come from the tropical region here. And having been taken way poleward, it's spinning, its potential vorticity is a lot less than the air around. So it's going to develop anticyclonic relative vorticity. So if this air comes up here, it will develop as an anticyclone. And this equally will be a cyclone here, a trough here. And so you can invert in your head, but you can do it more exactly if you want to. And a lower, a higher surface, 330K today, looks like this. Um, you can see the uh, tropopause further south here and the structure in the stratosphere here. It's not showing much structure in the troposphere here because of the contour unit chosen. If you look on the PV2 surface, the dynamical tropopause, you can see the structure on the tropopause. So the 315 contour would correspond just about to that. And the 330 contour would correspond roughly with, with, with this one here. Um, but this shows you, uh, so this, if I have one map to put on my grave, it's this theta on PV2, which shows beautifully the structure of the upper, upper troposphere. But if you're going to invert the problem, you need the lower troposphere, in particular, you need boundary temperature as well. And one great thing about the potential vorticity then, that we can look at the real world and we can look at our simpler models or our more complex models. These show some baroclinic wave simulations. And um, these are actually high resolution ones done later. But this, the contours here show surface temperature for a, a a very nonlinear baroclinic wave. And the shading shows upper level of the uh, uh, 300 Kelvin isentrope PV. So you can see the potential vorticity from the stratosphere has come down here. And the, the baroclinic wave is very much the interaction of the surface temperature anomalies with the potential vorticity anomalies in the upper, upper troposphere. If you look at the PV2 surface, this is what the structure looks like. So I, I know it's too fast to go through it, but what I want to say is you can look at your models in this way, whether they're very idealized or more co complex, and you can look at the real atmosphere and you can try and link the, the two going on. Here's some work that a student of mine did later on, um, this Turles, um, Evangelis Turles, and this was looking at blocking highs. This was a blocking high. On a geopotential surface, it looked like this, because geopotential isn't conserved, this is an anticyclone here, and there's a surface anticyclone underneath. If you look at theta on PV2, this air has come um, ahead of this trough here. This air has come way forward here. As it comes way forward, it develops an anticyclonic spin. 
and that anticyclonic spin tends to cut itself off. And then you get a cutoff anticyclonic PV here, and that's a blocking high. So you get these arguments where you can really understand what's going on in this. Tim Willings and a few of us um, showed this one later on. This is the development of a, of a Greenland blocking, which then changes the phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. And this one is wrapping up the other way ahead of this trough here. You get this low, um, low latitude air going way forward here. It cuts itself off. And that's what it looks like. Um, how, how much later is that? Uh, essentially a day and a half later or a day and six hours later. So you develop this cutoff in, in, in uh, PV here. Now, once you've done this, you know you, that that cannot be got rid of other than taking it back to low latitudes or from diabetic processes. So immediately you know that this is going to last a long time when you get something like that. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's happened in middle latitudes on this, but I want to show you um, in this last part of my talk that you can use, um, it, it's very important to use potential vorticity in the more tropical regions as well. And this isn't done as much, so I'm trying to persuade people that this is important. This is one thing that Mark Rodwell and I did back in 1995, which is looking at the flow into the Indian monsoon. So these are trajectories in a simple model of the air coming from the southern hemisphere at low levels, picking up all the water in the southern Indian Ocean, crossing the equator by the, by the East African highlands, and then coming into the northern hemisphere, looking as if it wants to avoid India, but actually deciding it will deposit some of its water over India and then into the Bay of Bengal. Now, if you think about this in terms of potential vorticity, this air here has negative potential vorticity in this region, and that's what I'm showing over here, has negative potential vorticity. So one of the problems some of us were thinking about is how does air that has negative potential vorticity change to being air that has positive potential vorticity? Because the, the rest of the, if it's going to stay in the Northern Hemisphere, it's, it's got to have positive potential vorticity. I'll show you what happens if it doesn't change its potential vorticity. So in fact, the Somali jet, which is very strong here, is where the potential vorticity still has its southern hemisphere negative sign, but the Coriolis parameter is, is the northern hemisphere positive. So there's essentially an instability there with the air accelerating down the isentropes. But the potential vorticity does change through the sources and sinks slowly on this, just enough that the air has positive potential vorticity. So, um, uh, let me just look at this one. Playing around with a simple model, then you can say, well, suppose the sources of P potential vorticity are not as strong, then actually the air does avoid India. It actually, some of it curves back into the southern hemisphere uh, there and in here. So, and if you put more sources of potential vorticity, a, a strong drag over the, over the Indian Ocean, the air is assimilated in the northern hemisphere much easier and still it avoids India. So actually getting the potential vorticity just right is crucial to getting the Indian monsoon right. Now I wanted to show a little bit more about the Indian monsoon and things in that area. And this is going to go into a video, I hope, in a moment. So um, this again with a, a, a student, Ricardo Fonseca, we were interested in the potential vorticity behavior associated with the Indian summer monsoon. And if you look at a high isentropic surface, then we're looking at the, this 370 Kelvin, we're looking at the upper uh, troposphere in the tropics here in the high latitudes. Well, from 30 north, we're definitely looking at the stratosphere here. And you can see the, the monsoon anticyclone here with its low potential vorticity in the middle associated with all the convection going on there. And this region above the convection, it being the potential vorticity being decreased. But around this anticyclone, you can see the high potential vorticity air being dragged down towards the equator. And this corresponds, this cyclonic vorticity here corresponds to the mid Pacific trough. Now, that's what it looks like on a, if you take an average. If you take a particular day, you see a lot more structure. You can see this really looking a bit like a fluid here. 
you see this large potential water statistic here. But you can see also that air from the northern hemisphere comes in streamers into the southern hemisphere here. So that's certainly what this still looks like. And you can see it perhaps interacting with the southern hemisphere jet and with the waves on that jet. Now, this is where I pray that the video will work. Yeah, it does. OK, so this is a video for a few days. You can follow some of these streamers that come into the southern hemisphere. There's another one there. And um, so there's some over here. So that the air crosses the equator here. And uh, if you time average and zone average this, you call it the Hadley cell. But this is what the, the Hadley cell is made up of, is these streamers of air crossing the equator. And um, I've just isolated for that same year, a few days in, in July, actually. This is one day, here's the monsoon anticyclone, and these are the winds. This is again the 370 Kelvin surface. And this is air, a, there's been a burst of convection in the uh, Bay of Bengal region here. In the upper troposphere, there's a burst of flow across the equator, and it takes northern hemisphere potential vorticity with it. I suspect if the ECMWF data analysis was, was even more perfect, you could see this high potential vorticity come directly into the southern hemisphere. If we look at lags and leads, we see this coming in ahead of the trough in the southern hemisphere jet and actually amplifying the trough ridge structure here um, and amplifying the jet. And then five days later, the same thing happens, but now it happens with an amplification of the uh, Philippines convection here and the motion across the equator with its PV is here. And again, it comes in just upstream of Australia, again, amplifying the waves and, um, and also amplifying the southern hemisphere jet. And those were examples from June, July and August. And I'm just going to show you a couple of examples from the winter as time, Northern Hemisphere winter DJF. So the convection now is in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and this is one day in January. And this is now going to be look at a slightly lower Peter's surface here. And this shows the uh, anomaly in outgoing long wave radiation. And outgoing long wave radiation in the tropics is a very good indicator of the strength of convection because where, it, where it's cold, that means you're looking at cloud tops, the tops of convection. So at this time, there's a lot of convection going on over uh, the Indonesian region here, the warm pool region here, the maritime continent. And quite, there's been quite a lot over Africa as well. And if you see corresponding to this, similar sort of things that the air from the Southern hemisphere comes into the northern here hemisphere, and you get this amplified ridge and the, the air in the, the, the subtropical jet air from there being dragged way south towards the equator. And again, the, the uh, anticyclone in the East Asian region here and the Asian jet here. And in this period, next period, the Asian jet extends. So there's been a burst of convection here. In the Asian jet, you get the strong anticyclone and the extension of the Asian jet. So lots of interesting fluid mechanics that one can see in, in the atmosphere when, when you start looking at these sorts of maps. And I was going to show you last example here. Um, and this shows um, on the 21st of January, 2008, it shows the 370 Kelvin surface here, but this is the five days before on the 350 Kelvin surface. And again, I'm going to show you things that link with theoretical ideas. There's been a burst of convection in the South, uh, the South Pacific Convergence Zone down here. And associated with that is this strong flow towards the equator. And this triggers um, a stationary Rossby wave train to develop. It's actually a westward moving mixed Rossby gravity wave, an equatorial wave that because there's a strong westerly wind in, in this region, in this season, can be stationary. So you get a strong stationary wave associated with the convection forcing it here. So you get this wave rippling down of, of the equator here with the air here. So it looks as if there's nothing non here, but at the end here, you run out of westerlies and the wave breaks essentially. But this mixed Rossby gravity wave 
propagates in the vertical. And five days later, it's propagated in the vertical. And you get this beautiful event going on in the upper troposphere, where a filament of the northern hemisphere air comes into the southern hemisphere. And then a filament of the northern hemisphere air comes, well, in fact, more than a filament, you get quite a, a cascade of northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere air into the northern hemisphere. It actually interacts with the northern hemisphere Atlantic jet. And it, over the next three days, that jet extends to Europe. And I don't think, I can't prove it's uh, causative, but I'm pretty damn sure it is from the, all the theoretical ideas we're here. So here we have a link with Rossby waves here on the equator, equatorial Rossby waves, uh, mixed Rossby gravity wave. And here we have interactions with the, uh, the Atlantic jet and the behavior of that jet. So I hope I've told you enough to give you an idea where the, um, where the ideas came from and how really we were able, just at the right time, uh, a lot of, most of the things that you're successful in research is just a question of putting together uh, things that were there before, you have to know about them and you have to have the right situation. So there was what happened before, there was the studies of frontogenesis, and there was the ECMWF analyses, and then putting it all together, and then seeing we have a great way here of both looking at the atmosphere and of developing theories of that atmosphere and understanding it. So it's well established um, in both observational theoretical perspectives for viewing things going on in the extratroposphere, uh, extratropics. But um, I hope I've shown enough at the end there to suggest that it, I think it's a crucial tool as well for looking at the tropics and for looking at tropical, extratropical interaction. And then it spurs you into looking at these particular case studies and understanding them better, and then looking at how models simulate them. And one of the things I've shown you there is how you get the burst, you get a strong convection, then you get a burst in the upper troposphere into the other the other hemisphere. And um, that burst is quite shallow in the vertical. So your model has got to get the depth of the convection right, the outflow level of convection at the right level with the right vertical um, extent. And then it's got to have little enough mixing that it really can move into the other hemisphere and either be mixed in in the subtropics or even get as far as a subtropical jet. So there's a challenge to models you can erect with this as well. But I think I will stop there and leave it for questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Brian, for the very inspiring talk. And um, um, I can tell you that I, I've read your 70 pages long paper while I was a master's student and uh, I didn't fall asleep but it was very, very fascinating and inspiring actually. Okay, so um, there are some remarks in the chat, which I will read. So there is one remark from Marque Pascal and he writes that it would be important to avoid the use of isentropes for theta surfaces in the lower troposphere where moisture prevents theta to represent the entropy of moist air. It is needed to use the third law generalization of theta to talk of moist air isentropes. And then he also writes that 300 Kelvin theta surface in Hoskins 1991 is not an isentropic surface in particular. Um, I'm not sure I understand the last comment. Um, if it's the 300 Kelvin isentropic surface, then it is an isentropic surface. But uh, I, and maybe it links with the first part. I mean, there, there's, there's two ways you can approach regions where uh, the moisture and latent heat release are very important. And um, one is to use, continue to use theta because there the inversion is, is much easier. So the invertibility is much easier if you're using theta. But then the conservation properties um, are, are more complex. And now you can try and use a moist isentropic uh, definition, 
uh, as your as your conservative variable as your variable for the thermodynamics but and that is easier in terms of the conservation but is more difficult in terms of the inversion so i think you can do either i wouldn't say so um i'm going to in the middle latitudes in general um using potential temperature i think is fine and then thinking about the the heat sources and sinks of the actual um, latent heat release. Um, if you're dealing with the tropics, the moist processes then become more directly important than the thermodynamics. And but still, the inversion thing makes me want to use potential temperature. Um, but I think you can do it either way. Okay. Um... And then he also writes that uh, it's true in the upper troposphere in the convective clouds with moisture preventing theta to represent moist air entropy. Again, I mean, I think I would come back to the same argument I've given now. Okay. That, um, if we're using potential temperature, then the conservation properties away from the convection itself. So I'm not wanting to look at I wanted to say, right, the convection has put this air there and what's going to happen to it. So there I can look at um, using potential temperature and conservation of the potential vorticity in a pretty good way because it only takes three days or so for it to get from the equ equator right through to the Southern Hemisphere jet. So the radiative processes aren't going to change it very quickly. And there may be mixing processes that come in, probably too much in models. But um, I, I think, again, I, as long as I'm not actually looking in the convective region, I think I'm fine. OK, uh, then uh, Joe is writing. Thanks for the great talk. Could you brief a little bit of the use of potential vorticity in oceanography? Oh, yes. I, I must admit I haven't used it there. I mean, I, my my sort of thing of the um, overworld and the underworld, that picture there, I won't bother to share the screen again, but if you turn that upside down, it's basically the ventilated thermocline. And so the, the, um, the density surfaces or potential density that cross or entropy, what the entropy surfaces that cross that ventilated thermocline, you're getting the same behavior really. And um, in the ocean then, there's a lot more stress on, on mixing up the potential vorticity and creating and getting a homogeneous region of, of potential vorticity, whereas the atmosphere usually um, doesn't allow the motions to continue that long. I think it happens in the subtropics uh, where some of those uh, elements come and it happens in that surf zone in the stratosphere. So we do get the regions of this mixing up. But potential vorticity, I, mean, I, I suspect there's people listening now who are much better at answering this question than I am because I haven't used it and I I think one of the dangers of getting to my age is that you you might pontificate on things that you don't know anything about and I, I think I'm going to leave it to other people here who know more about it than I do. Okay so um, while we are waiting for for other questions um, so Actually, the, an, a question came. Okay, so um, Lionel Pay wrote, thanks for the interesting talk. Could you briefly comment on your take on the use of the PV framework in weather forecasting as compared to the QG framework? I see them as very complementary and not exclusive from one other. Okay. Um Maybe my view is slightly different. Um, if you use quasi-geostrophic theory uh, as a basis for a model and try and simulate weather, you will get an approximate behavior there. If you use semi-geostrophic, you would get, uh, it will allow you to get much stronger jets and fronts. So the vorticity will become much more realistic in quasi-two-dimensional structures. So quasi-geostrophic extended to semi-geostrophic. And the semi-geostrophic allows you to have large departures from the reference stratification, whereas quasi-geostrophic doesn't really. Um, so I think it takes you uh, more towards the 
the complex atmosphere allowing the intensity of the structures that we see. Um, Quasi-geostrophic theory, you shouldn't really develop vorticity greater than 0.2 or 0.3 times the Coriolis parameter, otherwise the Rossby number is getting close to one and the theory is no longer valid. With quasi-semi-geostrophic, really what, almost what we said is that quasi-geostrophic works a lot better than you have any right to expect. It works when the Rossby numbers of order one, but you should view it just in slightly distorted space. So I think semi-geostrophic takes you further towards the more complex thing, but the, the, uh, the message is not in general very different. There's an omega equation with, with um, semi-geostrophic theory as there is with quasi-geostrophic theory. I think one of the nice things that's come from semi-geostrophic is the fact that potential vorticity is the, the stability of the atmosphere. It combines the stratification with the, the the gravitational stability with the inertial stability. And whereas n squared is fixed in quasi-geostrophic theory, in semi-geostrophic you see that really we should be allowing n squared to vary and it's this inertial gravitational stability. The com combination of those two is the potential vorticity. And that gives the stability of motions along isentropic surfaces. So I think it takes you quite a bit further, but quasi-geostrophic gives you a, a pretty good understanding of it. So there is another question. Can you expand on how much more difficult it would be to work with moisture-inclusive isentropes rather than isotherms? Yeah, you, you're taking me back here. I, I must admit, I haven't thought about this for the last 20 years. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I, mean, it, I think I could answer to an extent. I think I, I, I mean, I did try thinking about this and I, the inversion problem. I mean, I'm trying to remember people have, I think um, Alan Thorpe and Kerry Emanuel made, did make advances on this. And I think I would suggest you, you go and read some of what they did and maybe others that followed them. Um, I mean, it's definitely more difficult because you can't just put, I mean, you could write the, the theta with the hydrostatic approximation directly in terms of, say, um, the vertical gradient of geopotential or something, you know, so d phi dz gives you a thermodynamic variable, whereas clearly with moisture and you've got a lot more than that. So getting this inversion does involve probably separate, um, if you were going to really invert it, you'd have to, um, obtain the moisture distribution as well, and then you could separate the problem, you could manage to do it, um, but it's certainly more complex because writing the at down the analytical equation, whether you did it um, in um, ordinary space or transform space, is that much more difficult and it, uh, with the moisture available there. So I think I put it as a challenge, <laughs> challenge to some of you watching to do it again and um, Perhaps you can bring me up to date on it. Another question by uh, Chao Li. How does the Tibetan plateau influence the PV and mid-latitude atmospheric circulation in summer and in winter? Oh. <laughs> okay, that's not much to ask, is it? Um, well, in summer, the, the, the first thing about the Tibetan plateau is it actually is the warmest spot on the Earth's surface in summer. Now, that's a strange thing to say for anyone who's climbed or thought about climbing the mountain, but actually in potential temperature, it's the warmest. The, the Tibetan plateau in June, July, August is about 390, as I remember. So it's the, it's the warmest spot on the Earth's surface in potential temperature. And even quite the, the small amount of boundary layer convection and slightly deeper convection over the Tibetan plateau means that the potential vorticity above there is being influenced directly almost from the surface. And so you can get low potential vorticity formed quite easily above the plateau. Um, and it also, the, the barrier effect is also important both winter and summer. In the winter time, it is the, it is the barrier effect more that, uh, um, and the, uh, and the barrier effect is crucial both in winter and summer. Um, the the uh, 
air coming across the equator certainly can't get any further than the, the to, uh, Himalayan region, the really high peaks there. And so it rains, most of its water falls out in the um, Bangladesh or the foothills of the Himalayas there. And also the, the circulation around there is influenced. And in, in winter, then it is um, again a, a much of a, a barrier to, to what is going on there in terms of the flow. So it's more the barrier effect at that point. And the so, air, and the, in fact, I'm the simplest view of the of the Tibetan plateau in the winter is that it forces the subtropical jet to go north of it. So the subtropical jet comes along and during the winter goes north of the plateau. And then there's a transition where it's in, as you go towards summer, it suddenly switches to the other side of the plateau. So it's, it's the subtropical jet really doesn't spend very long going over the plateau. Okay, so one last question, Brian, before we close the official part of, of, of the seminar. And after this question, we'll see if, uh, if there will be more question and if you would like to answer them. Okay, so um, uh, the last question comes from Trond Iversen. Did I understand correctly that when PV is advected across the equator, slantwise convection is triggered because of local symmetric instability? I think, um, and you can call it slantwise convection, but the ice, and it's essentially, I look on it as inertial instability on an isentropic surface. And that's the same as slantwise convection, actually. Um, so when you cross the equator, the jet is un inertially unstable on that isentropic surface. And the acceleration down the, ice, down the pressure gradient is a, is a limited form of inertial instability, which then is um, just in the Somali jet there. So it's a tremendous acceleration of the air at that point. So you can call it slantwise convection. I would prefer to, to name it as uh, inertial instability on an isentropic surface. But in a hydrostatic atmosphere, the two are the same. Okay, so um, I stopped the recording. Um, 